In May 2000, a computer virus spread across the globe, infecting millions of computers in just hours. Spread by email, Lovebug was one of the first examples of a major computer virus outbreak that caused disruption around the world. It's estimated to have caused billions of pounds in damage. For almost 20 years, the story behind Lovebug and why it was created remained a mystery, but not anymore. I'm Danny Palmer. This is ZDNet Security Updates, and I'm joined by Jeff White, investigative journalist and author of upcoming book, Crime.com, who tracked down the author of Lovebug. Thanks for joining me, Jeff. So first of all, take us back to the year 2000. What happened when Lovebug was unleashed? Well, I was working within an internet company back in 2000. I just remember pandemonium in the office as person after person received this email with the title, I love you opened the attachment, clicked on the attachment, uh, and then was then immediately infected. So what this virus did was it infected files, certain types of files, rendered them unusable. Um, and it just went around the office like wildfire. Because the other thing the virus did was when it got into your inbox, it would then send copies of itself to people in your Outlook uh, contact book. So for every person who received it, a whole bunch of other people received it. So let's say 50 other people receive it, they send it to 50 other people, they send it to 50 other people. And what's amazing about that is it only takes, and I can't quite believe this even to this day, it only takes six hops for 50 people and 50 people and 50 people to infect everybody in the world, presuming everybody in the world has a computer. So this thing spread like wildfire. Um, and one of the main problems with it wasn't necessarily the damage it did, although when it landed on a computer, it would do damage. It was the amount of traffic it was generating. I mean, this was back in 2000. A lot of people, were on, almost everybody was on dial-up internet connection. The speeds we're used to now didn't exist. And so email servers were just falling over and clogging up with this thing. So some of the damage that was caused was actually caused by people unplugging their email system from the internet to stop themselves being overloaded by the millions of copies of this virus uh, being generated. So yeah, it went around the world uh, and, and it, millions and millions of people got infected. About 45 million machines is the estimate for how many got infected. Uh, now, investigators started working out what had happened one of the things the virus did was to steal people's passwords. And so it would send copies of the password back to a server. So the police went, okay, wh which server are we talking about? Where is this? It was a server in the Philippines it was being sent back to. Okay, so who owns the account? It set, set up the account on this server. They got hold of an email address. They got that back to a physical address. And then they raided the apartment. Uh, and the apartment they raided uh, was somebody that they thought was connected with the virus. Pretty soon they started to work out this person was connected with a computer science student and attention sort of uh, focused on that computer science student and the college that, that student was at. But this again is 2000. The Philippines at the point had no computer hacking crime, no crime in place for computer hacking. So no one could be prosecuted. So even though they had suspects, they couldn't actually prosecute anybody. So 20 years ago, there was a sort of press conference with one of the suspects, but he never really admitted it. And then the whole story died a death. And really for 20 years, that's been the case. The love bug was one of the most impactful early viruses. Really, it was the first mass virus. There have been a few before, there was Melissa, there was the Morris worm, but love bug really set the scene for this and nobody was ever put in handcuffs or sent to prison for it. So 20 years on, uh, why was it that you uh, went to look for who created it and how did you go about tracking down the author? Well, it, he, this guy just went to ground. So the, the lead suspect in the case was a guy called Onel de Gutzman, a Filipino, uh, and also a colleague of his called Michael Buen, who we'll come on to later. So these two chaps, if you look around the internet, often credited with creating the virus together. Now, Michael Buen is still around. He's he, somebody with his name, with his profile, is still around on the internet. Onel de Gutzman just vanished, just no sign of this guy at all. There were rumours he worked for Microsoft, he'd been hired by Microsoft. There's rumors that he would work for the United Nations, that he was in Austria, all these crazy rumors. I was reading, um, for the book that I've written, crime.com, I, I wanted to track this guy down. And for a couple of reasons, number one, it's the big enigma, you know, like who started this big virus off back in 2000. But also, um, Lovebug was really my sort of first entry into technology journalism uh, and a failed entry at that. I emailed The Guardian with a sort of badly worded, mediocre article about Lovebug um, that they not only decided not to print, uh, probably the right decision, but they also emailed back and said, you know, thanks for this, but sending us an email with the title Lovebug in the middle of a computer virus with the same name probably isn't the best way to get into journalism. So I sort of felt like I maybe had a score to settle. I started looking around for an elder Gutzman and I came across 
uh, a Filipino language forum where his name was mentioned. And somebody mentioned that they'd seen him in a particular market working at a mobile phone store. And that was it. That was all they had. And that was from years ago. I was in the Philippines anyway, because another chapter of the book is about the uh, hacking of Bangladesh Bank by suspected North Korean hackers. And they laundered the money through the Philippines. So I thought, well, I'll go to the Philippines. I'll cover the Bangladesh Bank story, but I'll also have a look and see if I can find this guy in this market he's meant to work in. I turn up to the market. It's chaos. This place is just hell on wheels there's just market stalls everywhere and i thought well i just need to find the mobile phone store because that's where he supposedly worked i rounded a corner and there's 50 mobile phone stores <laughs> with thousands of people working at them so i sort of paused for a bit and thought what i'm going to do so I, I wrote his name on a piece of paper uh and i just started showing it to people almost completely at random just you know does anybody know this man i must have looked like a, a tourist dad who'd lost his kids you know <laughs> have you seen this person um, and eventually somebody said, yes, yeah, I'd, um, uh, he worked a while ago. Um, I know him. I said, well, do you know where he is now? He said, well, he's across town. There's a, a shopping mall across town where he works. So again, I go across this shopping mall. I get my piece of paper out. I go around the shops. And in the back of this mall, right at the back in this sort of dingy section of stalls, somebody finally says, he's over there. That's his stall over there. And I go and there's a guy at the stall and I tap him on the shoulder. Oh. I, I tap this guy on the shoulder and um, <laughs> he turns around and it's not him. And I thought, damn it. But I said, look, oh, no, the Gutsman, does he work here? Yes, he works here. He'll be back tomorrow. What sort of time will we be back tomorrow? Usually about three or four in the afternoon. And I thought, right, so my flight out of the Philippines is tomorrow at 7 p.m. So if I don't get this guy tomorrow, if he doesn't turn up to work, <laughs> I've, got, I've come all this way for no story. So I turned up at the shopping mall the next day and I turned up at nine in the morning when it first opened up and I sat there for hours just waiting for this guy because I didn't want to miss him. And sure enough, he turned up and uh, he confessed all. It was remarkable. I expected I'd have to sort of somehow engineer him into sort of, you know, admitting and present my evidence. And no, he said, yeah, it was me. I did it. And the interesting thing is that despite how it was such a prolific virus, there was no sort of mastermind evil scheme behind it um i believe the reason he created it because he wanted to access the internet for free exactly so yeah yeah he had another goodsman had this view which was ahead of its time which was that internet access was a human right and that everybody should be able to get it and you've got to realize at this time people are on dial-up connections uh, a lot of those dial-up connections you go through a modem you enter a password and it allows you access so another goodsman's logic was well look if you've got a password and you've bought a password, that should be shared with people so that other people can enjoy internet access as well. So what he did was he developed this virus that would steal internet access passwords so that he could get online for free. Um, he, he, he regrets that. He definitely regrets uh, breaking the law. What made his virus different, it was interesting. It was a cobbled together, really, of a number of things. There was already uh, a Visual Basic script going around that would do the task that he, he wanted to do, stealing passwords. There was also a script that would send copies of the email to loads of people in, in somebody's Outlook address book. So he combined the two, and that was his key mistake, if you like. It's the thing that made the virus successful, but it's the thing that got him in the most trouble. He, he created the virus that would automatically spread and would automatically send the passwords back. That was one thing that he did that got him in a lot of trouble, because if you think about it, from the moment he released that virus, there was no off switch. There was no way of reining it back in. As soon as he let it go, it was a self-propagating worm. But the other thing that he did, and this was the work of, of perhaps unconscious, but genius nonetheless, he, he thought, well, how do I get people to open this email up? He'd been already doing the same thing on people in, in the Philippines, and he could chat to them and pretend you know, that he knew them and they should open this file up and so on. But when he sent it worldwide, he had to have a lure in the email that would have universal appeal, would have worldwide appeal, so that even if he had nothing to do with it, wasn't touching it, people around the world would, would fall for the trick. And he thought, well, what, what does everybody want? What, does, what do people want in life? Everybody wants love. So he called it the love bug. He, he said it's a love letter. Everybody wants to open a secret love letter. He came up with this genius lure, and it worked, and it worked in spades. And so he basically created this virus. It was about one in the morning. He let the thing go. He then went and got drunk with his buddy, not realizing the sort of shitstorm that he'd released around the world. And sure enough, the next day he came back, the headlines start swirling. And so 
his mother got rid of all of his computer equipment, but she left some computer disks in the flat. And when the police raided, they found these computer disks and they found Michael Buen's name on the computer disks. That guy, Michael Buen, who I mentioned earlier, credited as being the co-author. So his name was on the disks. So the police kind of pulled him in and the police were interested in him. Michael Buen had nothing to do with it, according to Arnold de Gutzman, the guy who admitted writing it. Uh, Arnold de Gutzman then went to ground. For a year, he says he didn't touch a computer. Um, he now works on a mobile phone repair store in, uh, in the Philippines. He is a very sanguine guy. He regrets what he did. He regrets breaking the law. But there's still a sense that this was, you know, this was the big moment in his life. And what you know, troubles me really about this is he's clearly a gifted guy. He's clearly a, a smart guy. And I don't think his life has ended up where he would have wanted it to be, certainly from what I saw of it. So in a way, it's a sort of bittersweet, uh, bittersweet story. And of course, now he's got kids and he realizes that the kids at some stage are going to find out who he is and what he's done. And he's going to have to sort of explain that to them and, and try and put them on the right course. So it's interesting. His life's ended up with a, in, in a slightly bittersweet place. It's certainly an interesting story. And it's fascinating to you know, hear about how you tracked them down and how things were sort of back then. It's 20 years ago is, is a long time, really, if you think about it. But the way the email spread with a lure, with, which was just saying a, a love letter, yep. even now in 2020, those sorts of things still work and are still powering malware and other viruses now. Absolutely right. I mean, one of the depressing things about writing a book about cybercrime is, is the extent to which things change rapidly and massively but but stay the same as you say you know the, the email lure has been the way in for so many of these hacks bangladesh bank theft of 81 million dollars phishing email so much as entertainment uh, caused huge damage 15 million dollars of damage for sony um to repair all of that phishing email the democratic national committee arguably swung the 2016 u.s presidential election that hack and changed the course of world history phishing email was what was behind uh, behind that in large part so, yeah, these phishing emails just keep it. I, I think I, in the book I describe them as the germ laden sneeze in the elevator. They're, they're, they're kind of, they, and, and, you know, to, to compare that to our current coronavirus times, if you look again, what are computer hackers using to try and tempt people to open their emails now? It's coronavirus. Click here for the latest information, click here to open the app, click here to get the, the thing that's going to save you from this virus. So, it, it, it frustrates me that people see computer hacking and cybercrime. Cybersecurity generally is being a technical subject. It's about code, it's about computers and servers and so on. It's not. If you look at these big hacks and the really successful ones, more often than not, it's about understanding people, what people respond to, what they go to, and what they're afraid of, what, they, what they're interested in, what they're afraid of, and capitalizing on those at the right point in the right way, and that will get you the result that you're after. The rest, as they say, the rest is just code. So when it comes to staying safe from uh, these attacks, uh, particularly on the human side, what can people and organizations who obviously employ thousands of people, uh, millions even, some of the biggest companies, what can they do to ensure that emails aren't opened with you know, change attachments which cause chaos like this? Yeah, there's this, there's this really interesting conversation. I've seen this play out at conferences that I've attended where there is this sense of, well, the users, the end users, shouldn't have to worry about this. If we're, as defenders, doing our job and doing it well, they should never even see these emails come through. It's about screening emails and all that kind of thing and antivirus software and so on. The problem is, on the other side of the industry, you've got, uh, the, on the dark side of the industry, you've got people constantly trying to defeat those defenses. And it's the old cliche of security. The hackers only have to be lucky once. As a defender, you've got to be lucky all the time. So those emails are going to get through. And I do think there's a job of work um, of, of, of educating employees still. It's interesting to me, you know, a lot of these conferences, people are asking, you know, what would you do tomorrow, you know, if you had a million pounds to spend in your organization? And a lot of the time, the answer is a public awareness campaign. So there's still a lot of work to do around getting people to kind of, you know, understand the threat, understand what goes wrong. Because ultimately, there's also a guilt issue, I think, that people click on a dodgy email, they don't want to tell IT support because they actually know, oh God, I've clicked on the wrong, I'll, click, I'll, just, I'll just keep it quiet, it'll be okay. So IT support don't necessarily get to find out. There's a, a friend of mine, who, um, a colleague of mine, who I've done some presentations with, who, who runs a phishing uh, uh, um, exercise company, a guy called Glenn Wilkinson. And the thing he does is brilliant, it's genius. 
whenever he's trying to fish somebody, he makes the email something that that employee shouldn't have got. So it seems like they've been accidentally CC'd into some really sensitive information. And he attaches his lure, his phishing attachment to that email. So of course the employee, even if they click on the email, even if they know they've done something wrong, they're not gonna report it to IT security because they shouldn't have been CC'd on the email themselves. They were trying to get access to this sensitive info that they shouldn't even have had. So the, using, the use of guilt and the use of, 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 of that lure and, and guilt to, to trick somebody into opening an email and then not reporting it, I think is really interesting. So again, there's education for employees saying, look, don't worry if you, don't feel bad if you click it, but do get in touch with us because we need to know. And also the other thing I think is too much of this is about castigating and chastising employees for, for, for doing things wrong. You clicked on the email, now you have to do a two month phishing awareness course or whatever. As well as the carrot, we need a stick, we need the carrot. You know, what about bottle of champagne for the department that didn't click on any of our phishing emails or free pizzas, you know, for a week if you <clears throat> don't fall for our phishing campaigns. You know, you can reward staff positively for not doing the stuff as well as jumping on them heavy uh, for doing stuff. Anyway, that's my, I'm not an IT security professional uh, in an organization, but that would be roughly my thoughts. Well, you've written a book on this, <laughs> uh, so you must know something. Uh, what's it called and when's it out? The book is called Crime.com, uh, From Viruses to Vote Rigging, How Hacking Went Global. It's out on August 10th, but um, it's on Amazon and Waterstones and a whole bunch of other places now. So you can pre-order it. Uh, and that way, when it's out on August 10th, you'll get, in fact, you might even get it slightly before August 10th sometimes. But anyway, you can buy it now if you want to. Thanks for joining me, Jeff. It's been really interesting. And for more on cybersecurity news and advice, uh, be sure to subscribe to ZDNet's YouTube channel for more of a ZDNet security updates and plenty of other videos. And there's also plenty of articles on the site as well. Thank you for watching.